This video is about electron deficiency and in particular the group 13 halides. Okay, so here's group 13. We'll start with boron and we'll consider boron trichloride as an example. So boron has three valence electrons, two S electrons and a P electron. Each of the chlorines contributes one electron, so we have six electrons in total, which is three pairs, so we have a trigonal planar boron trichloride. Okay, another way of representing this is if we consider the plane of the molecule to be perpendicular to the plane of the paper. So our boron trichloride looks like this. And the advantage of representing it like this is we can then show the empty p orbital that's sitting above and below the plane of the molecule. Okay, so we have sp2 hybridized boron, three pairs of electrons sitting around the boron and an empty p orbital. And because we only have six electrons around that central boron and an empty p orbital, we call it electron deficient because the octet rule is not being satisfied. Okay, so all the other elements in group 13 form electron deficient halides. Boron trichloride is this monomer form, but the other elements in group 13 actually dimerize in order to stabilize this electron deficiency. Okay, so if we consider gallium as an example, gallium, as well as these other elements uh, further down group 13, forms dimers. Okay, so instead of being GLCL3, it's GA2Cl6. And the nature of this molecule, the structure of this molecule, is instead of having trigonal planar gallium, what we have is two of the chlorines sitting here as terminal gallium chlorine bonds. Then we have a chlorine up here, and then another gallium trichloride monomer sitting like this, and then what we have is lone pairs on these chlorines forming dative covalent bonds with the other gallium. Okay, so this gallium trichloride is donating into this gallium, and the chlorine on this gallium is donating into the other one, so you have this sort of cluster in the centre. Okay, and all these other elements, apart from boron, form these dimeric species. Boron chloride always stays, boron halides in fact always stay uh, as monomers. So because the group 13 halides are electron deficient, they have some interesting chemistry. They can accept electrons, which means they are Lewis acids. Okay, and the way this happens, for example, we've got our boron trichloride species here. And we know there's an empty p orbital sitting there on the boron. And so species with a lone pair of electrons can come and denote, donate that lone pair of electrons into the boron and what you then get is a dative covalent bond between this species and the boron. Okay, So in this case it's the ammonia, the lone pair on the ammonia is forming a dative covalent bond with the boron. And what happens, the boron is now, instead of being sp2 hybridised, the boron is now sp3 hybridised. It's got four bonds around it, four pairs of electrons, it's tetrahedral geometry. And then we'll just fill in our ammonia up the top. Okay, so the boron's gone from being trigonal planar to tetrahedral. Now the sort of chemistry and in fact the energetics of what can go on here tells us quite a lot about the bonding uh, in, this, in these uh, boron trihalides. Okay, so if we consider boron trihalide as BX3, where X is equal to fluorine, chlorine or bromine. And then if we consider the reaction of BX3 with an amine, we're going to look at pyridine, where pyridine is this structure here, so an aromatic amine. Okay, so we've got our pyridine forming a complex with our BX3, just like this reaction up here a dative covalent bond between the lone pair on the nitrogen and the boron down there. Now what you might expect to happen is a difference in energetics between the three reactions where X is fluorine, chlorine or bromine. 
And what you might expect is that if you've got a boron trifluoride species, fluorine is really electronegative. Okay, so fluorine is going to be drawing electron density away from that boron extremely strongly. Okay, if it's drawing electron density away from that boron, it's making it more electron deficient. If it's more electron deficient, then presumably it's a stronger Lewis acid. Okay, this is what we'd expect. But if we look at the data, okay, so the energetic data for these species, okay, so we're looking at these delta H values, so enthalpy of reaction in kilojoules per mole. Then for the boron trifluoride reaction with pyridine, we see that delta H is minus 143 kilojoules per mole. For chlorine, it's minus 189. And for bromine, it's minus 217. Okay, it's this bromine here that's the largest negative value, the biggest magnitude. Okay, so delta H is the largest negative value for this reaction where X is bromine. So this is the most exothermic. Okay, but we think that the fluorine compound is the one that's the strongest Lewis acid. So what's going on here? Something's happening to counteract this effect of electronegativity. So what's happening in this system to make that boron trifluoride actually the weakest Lewis acid? Okay, and we can tell that from energetics. So what's happening in this case? Well, if we draw our boron trifluoride out again, and we'll draw it perpendicular to the plane of the paper, so we can put in our empty p orbital here. Now, what we know about fluorine, fluorine's sharing one of its electrons with the boron to make this covalent bond here, but fluorine's also got six other electrons. Okay, and those six other electrons are sitting around the boron, around the fluorine, sorry, as lone pairs. Okay, fluorine's really small and boron's really small, so actually these p orbitals can overlap. So just as you'd get a pi bond, in this case, you're sharing two electrons from that orbital back into that boron orbital, and we call this pi backbonding. Okay, it's a bit different from a normal pi bond. In a normal pi bond, you'd have one electron here and one electron here, and they'd be shared. In this case, both electrons are on the fluorine and they're being shared into the boron, so we call it pi backbonding. Okay, so why would this make the series go in the opposite direction to what we'd expect? The reason for this is that boron and fluorine are really similar in size. Okay, so you're going to have really similarly sized p orbitals for the boron and fluorine. As you go to boron chlorine, you're going to start to get a bit of a mismatch. Okay, chlorine's a bigger atom, and the p orbitals with the lone pairs of electrons are getting quite a lot bigger. And when we get down as far as bromine, there's our boron p orbital, our bromine p orbitals are going to start getting really, really big. Okay, so you can see quite clearly from this schematic that the best overlap is going to come down in this boron fluorine. Okay, so we're getting donation of lots of electron density from that fluorine lone pair p orbital into the empty p orbital of the boron. Okay, that's stabilizing that empty p orbital. It's making the boron less electron deficient. Okay, so it's actually making it a weaker Lewis acid. Okay, so this is going against electronegativity. The fluorine, in terms of electronegativity, is going to be the strongest at pulling electron density away, but it's also the strongest at donating electron density back via this pi bonding.